So the next speaker in the session is uh, Professor Eker Mandelkoff. Um, Professor Mandelkoff um, has a background in physics and um, he did his PhD in Heidelberg and then moved um, for some time to Brandeis University in Massachusetts in the States. And then um, he went back to Germany, in particular to Hamburg where he's been uh, there till uh, 2011, I believe, when he moved to the uh, German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases in Bonn. Uh, Professor Mandelkoff, together with um, his wife Eva, which is also present here, has been uh, uh, leaders in the field of uh, tau protein structure aggregation and cellular functions uh, for many, many years. Um, He's been recipients of a number of uh, awards, uh, including the MetLife Award and the Potten Kim Award, and, and among others. Um, and uh, today he was gonna, um, he's going to talk about um, um, the role of tau protein in Alzheimer's disease and uh, other uh, tauopathies, structure and cellular functions. So thank you, Edgar, for being here, and uh, welcome to Spain. First question is, what button do I have to press in order to get this going? Oh, here we go. Thank you very much. We have a slight problem with movies, uh, but uh, I think it's going to work. So um, yeah, um, talking about Tao in Spain is a little like carrying owls to Athens, right? As the Greek proverb says, there's so much Tao work that has been done uh, over the years here in Madrid and in other places, mainly in the school of Jesus Avila, who's sitting in the first row, smiling. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's, it's nice to be back. And I remember many other uh, very interesting meetings that took place over the years in different cities of Spain. So, but my first time in Alicante. Okay. Well, um, so, uh, I, I'll just uh, review a few things that have happened in the lab over the past uh, several years and uh, give you a flavor of what we've been doing. Uh, so uh, let me first start. I mean, one, one, of the, one of the things that were dear to our heart uh, was uh, the structure of tau, the structure of microtubules. Most Taoists somehow have an origin in microtuber work. There were cell biologists working on microtubules. Tau turned out to be a microtubule associated protein. And after working a, on, a, a while on microtubule associated protein, people found themselves in the middle of Alzheimer's research because uh, in, in the year, I think, 85 or 86, it was discovered that the uh, the main component of the paired helical filaments in Alzheimer's disease was the tau protein. So that, uh, that uh, then led uh, to a number of uh, issues that ha and, and I have a few things that, um, listed here that I'm, I'd like to cover. So let me just go through these topics and, and let's see how we go on. So first, the uh, physiological and pathological functions of tau. As you all know, uh, tau is... Uh, Let's see, yeah, okay, so uh, is one of the deposits in Alzheimer's disease occurs in neurofibrillary tangles within neurons uh, in contrast to the amyloid plaques that are outside neurons and if you isolate it, you get these, um, you get these filaments, they're called paired helical filaments, although they are not really paired helical, but they look like it, and they have a characteristic uh, uh, periodicity of 80 nanometers, which dis distinguishes them from other types of uh, filaments. Now, uh, one of the important things uh, about tau is the spreading, which uh, is throughout the brain, which was discovered early on by Brock and Eva and Heiko Brock, actually. Uh, so these are now called the Brock stages, and you see that early stage is uh, uh, just here in the entorhinal region, then it's covering the temporal lobe, and then eventually uh, covering the entire cortex. And this correlates very well with the clinical symptoms, and that's why, why uh, you know, we, we can correlate the deposits that we see in the brain very accurately with, 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 the, uh, with the clinical di diagnosis. Now, uh, um, I mentioned that tau is a microtubule associated protein, so we, a quick word about microtubules. Microtubules occur in, does this move autonomously or not? I think it does, let me see. It's moving, okay. Uh, so we have here, a, a, we have here a, a, a neuron with a long extension, the, that's the axon, that poses a transport problem for the neuron because things at the synapse have to be fed from the cell body. The transport system of the uh, axon is, of course, the microtubule system. Microtubules can be thought of as tracks. 
and the, uh, uh, which uh, have motor proteins running along them in the forward direction, kinesin, and the reverse direction, dynein. And like a railroad track, it has to be stabilized by ties, and the ties for the microtubule system is the tau protein and other microtubule associated protein. They're shown as black hooks here. So uh, the hand-waving argument about the function of tau is that it stabilizes microtubules. It does actually a lot more, but, uh, but that's, that's the most basic function that was discovered early on by Mark Kirshner and colleagues uh, back about a little more than uh, uh, 50 years ago, I think by now, or 40 years actually. So one of them is dynamic instability of microtubules, which means micro microtubules are not simply static, but they grow and shrink, and that enables them to adjust to shape uh, changes within the cell. And also the other thing is, of course, the axonal transport is shown down here. <clears throat> Now, there are uh, also a number of hypotheses of uh, how tau can be toxic to cells. I mean, the, the, the honest answer is we, we're not really sure, because tau, uh, as I'll show you in a minute, has many different uh, proteins that ca it can interact with. But the microtubule-centric point of view is that, first of all, in a normal microtubule, uh, it, motor, motor proteins can move up and down the microtubule, and the microtubule is only sparsely decorated with tau protein. And therefore, a motor protein, which is driven by the power of ATP hydrolysis has no problem of moving along and pushing the tau out of the way if necessary. However, the two scenarios can happen. One is that overdecoration of microtubules, local overdecoration of microtubules, can inhibit the ac access of motor proteins to the to the motor protein, and then in, in that case you have a retardation of axonal transport. That's one of the uh, scenarios, and which can uh, then of course has effects on the nourishment of the synapse. The other, the contrary view is that uh, if the tau does not bind properly to the microtubule, for example, because it gets phosphorylated by certain kinases, then two things happen. The tau can come off the microtubule, and uh, when it comes off the microtubule, it is then free to associate with itself for reasons we don't really understand. But anyway, in the course of that, it can form uh, oligomers and paratelicothermins or tangles. And the other thing that happens is that uh, the, uh, the microtubules can fall apart, and therefore the tracks for transport disappear. So you have an obstacle in the brain that that can in inhibit axonal transport, and the tracks themselves are inhibited. Now, I should say, you know, a, a cautionary tale, this is all pictorial work. I mean, the disappearance of microtubules is observed in Alzheimer's disease, and of course the tangles are observed in Alzheimer's disease, but whether they're actually causal or the only causes of the pathology that we see, uh, that's a different issue. So uh, what protein are we talking of? Tau is uh, interesting from several points of view, uh, and the most interesting thing from a biophysical point of view is that it is a totally non-structured protein. So most proteins, as you know from the textbook, have a nice structure in terms of alpha, alpha structure, beta structure, et cetera, et cetera, uh, hydrophobic inside, hydrophilic outside. Tau is none of that. Tau is very hydrophilic, as already discovered early on, and therefore it has absolutely no reason to fold. And as a result of that, it does not fold in the globular shape. So it is accessible to many other proteins that, uh, that occur in the cell, for example, can be modified by many different uh, enzymes, kinases, uh, proteases, uh, phosphatases, etc. And this makes uh, the work on tau a little bit complicated. But anyway, here is, is a picture of the domain structure of tau. And the, the thing that I want to point out is this box here is the so-called repeat domain. Three or four repeats. As the green ones are alternative spliced segments of tau. tau. Anyway, the, the repeat domain is the one that interacts with the microtubules in a physiological sense, but it is also responsible for the formation of the paratelic filaments, and therefore the physiological function and the pathological function are encoded into the same part of the molecule. So it's like a switch, either pathological or physiological switch. The other thing shown here is the many phosphorylation sites that tau has, many of them threonine proline or serine proline motives that are suggestive of proline-directed kinases, and many of us have worked uh, and uh, analyzed these kinases in the phosphor uh, and, and the phosphorylation sites. Uh, let me just say there are actually too many, uh, uh, too many and too heterogeneous to really understand, but of course uh, the hope was to find particular kinases that are responsible for the pathological transition of tau, uh, um, but um, again, uh, in spite of a lot of work over the many de decades, it is still a little bit enigmatic what the role of uh, phosphorylation really is. Um, 
Then the other thing that was discovered uh, about uh, 15 years ago uh, is the uh, mutations that occur in tau protein, uh, which cause uh, uh, frontotemporal dementia primarily. These mutations were called FTDB17 uh, uh, because they're related. So the mutations have two functions. One is they actually usually increase the ability of tau to aggregate, and they decrease the interaction with microtubules, which fits with the general picture that aggregation is bad for the, for the cell and, uh, and, this is, and uh, loss of stability of microtubules is also bad for the cell. The, these, many of these mutations have been used to make cell models and animal models of tauopathy. They work quite well. They cause aggregation in the, in, in the tra transgenic mice, for example, which example I show some, uh, some examples later. And um, uh, many people have, uh, for example, uh, looked at uh, the uh, mutation P301L, which uh, uh, or P301S. In our lab, we have focused on the mutation Delta K280, which is also located in or near the, um, uh, the repeat domain and therefore would explain why it affects the uh, aggregation of tau. Uh, and the other mutation we have looked at uh, more recently is the A152T mutation, which is different from uh, most of the other mutations because A152T is a risk factor for PSP, basically, or uh, um, FTD related diseases, brain diseases, but it is located far outside the repeat domain and therefore not immediately related to uh, the assembly. And I'll show you that, in fact, this is, these two have different kinds of toxicity that you can observe in mouse models. Now, what about tau structure? Uh, here, a picture of a microtubule protofilament, alpha and beta subunits uh, um, uh, lined up nicely and nicely folded with alpha, in, uh, with actually alpha helical structure and beta strands in between. So, prototypic uh, globular proteins that uh, self assemble into microtubules. And you see a motor protein kinase in. Uh, all of this is so solved either by X ray diffraction or electron crystallography. Uh, it, also, nicely folded with alpha and beta. Uh, structural elements, and in contrast, a fantasy model of tau um, uh, sitting in an unfolded way on, the to on top of the microtubule. Uh, and, and, so, and, and this unfolded structure shows you that it is an open, loose uh, cushion sitting basically on the, on the surface of a microtubule, able to interact, or maybe able to shield the microtubule, depending on who has to be, whose axis has to be controlled. So this is the problem that we're dealing with. And uh, it also illustrates that because of this uh, highly um, soluble, uh, open, hydrophilic nature of tau, it does not aggregate. And one of the points that I'd like to make uh, is, is that tau by itself, and I'll show you some evidence in a minute, tau by itself does not aggregate. In spite of the fact that we see uh, aggregations, uh, aggregates of tau in, in various brain diseases uh, in a very stereotypical fashion, tau is so highly soluble, it has no reason to aggregate unless we assume that there is some other factor that helps the aggregation, and in fact, uh, um, I think the, the group of Jesus Avila was actually one of the first ones, the first one probably to show that uh, things like heparin sulfate or other uh, negatively charged macromolecules may play an important event in, uh, in helping tau to get on its way to aggregation. So tau by itself does not do any harm as far as aggregation is concerned, but in, co in the contact with other macromolecules it may do so. So here is uh, just a pictorial uh, representation of how a kinase molecule would like to attach to a microtubule surface, but it can do so only if it has a free surface. And if there are too, too many tau molecules, like the red one here, then it, it takes longer to attach, and therefore uh, axonal transport is retarded. <clears throat> So here, we did some solubility studies, just to back up what I just said a minute ago. Uh, and uh, so you, you, a lot of people, including ourselves, were trying to crystallize tau. That was, of course, a hope, hopeless task because 
only globular proteins, roughly speaking, crystallize well and not disordered proteins like tau. But the solubility in micromolar is, is shown. So in order to do crystallography studies, you, you look at the, uh, at, uh, at the solubility. And I show you here the solubility limit for tau full length is about 1,000 micromolar. Repeat domain is about 4,000 micromolar. If you express it in E. coli, you get it up to about 200 micromolar. And if, if you get it in SF9 cells, it's also about 200 micromolar. In E. coli, it, it, it gets expressed without phosphorylation. In SF9 cells, it is expressed in very high concentrations, in, in very high phosphorylation. But in both cases, they're totally soluble. The tau, tau protein is totally soluble, proving, for one thing, that the high phosphorylation does not necessarily drive tau into aggregation, which is normally the expression you get from this highly phosphorylated Alzheimer tau. But here is the concentration of tau in neurons is about one micromolar. So if you have a one micromolar protein, and it's soluble to up to 1,000 microdumal. What do you expect in terms of aggregation? You expect nothing, basically. And that's what happens in cells when you express them. The tau, as such, does not aggregate. And that's why it has taken such a long time, actually, from the discovery, let's say, in 1986, uh, as, as part of paratelic filaments, until the time it, uh, it was shown for, uh, to aggregate into in, in vitro. And that has to do with this very high uh, solubility. Now, let's. Uh, also compare, for example, here tau in the interstitial fluid uh, measured by David Holtzman's uh, uh, group, uh, 0 0.001 uh, micromolar, meaning a nanomolar, and in the CSF it's point, well, whatever, a lot of zeros, picomolar. So very, very low concentration. All this tau is not really aggregated unless it is complexed with somebody else. So self-assembly of tau by itself is highly improbable. Nevertheless, tau tauopathy is linked to the aggregation of tau, in most cases anyway, with a few exceptions. And therefore, we have to, if we want to understand the process of this pathological aggregation, we have to focus on aggregation-inducing factors. And the other conclusion is phosphorylation is not likely to be responsible for aggregation by itself. Certain phosphorylation sites may play a role, but we don't know really which ones they are. So here, another uh, picture of the structure of tau um, derived from NMR studies that, uh, that, uh, that were done with our colleagues uh, in, at the Max Planck Institute in Göttingen, Mar uh, Markus Zweckstetter and Christian Griesinger, showing basically uh, the uh, structural elements of tau uh, red, uh, short pieces of alpha helis, but, uh, and, and, and yellow, short pieces of beta strand, but none of this is stable. So all of it is very floppy, mobile around. The, 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 you have to imagine tau wobbling around all the time, not steady, unless, of course, it is bound to microtubers. We'll come to that. So, uh, the, uh, so it basically confirms on the NMR level that tau is a highly labile structure. The, uh, the two yellow things here are the two hexapeptide motifs that are essential for the aggregation of tau. These are the only places in tau that have a halfway hydrophobic character and, that's, uh, and, and high beta uh, propensity, and that's why they are also responsible for the aggregation of tau when aggregation happens with the help of some other cofactors. Uh, the slide also shows some of the many, so we, we, we are talking of the C-terminal domain as the microtubule assembly domain because it sticks to microtubules, and the projection domain uh, is called projection domain because it projects away from the microtubules, and the function of the projection domain is really poorly poorly understood, except that it contains a lot of the a lot of interesting binding sites for other proteins like FIN, SARC, PI3 kinase, HA3 domains, PIN1, etc., signaling molecules in general. So this is a proline-rich region. You can see uh, polyproline-like uh, 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 structural elements here. And, uh, uh, and so there's probably a signaling going on here. FIN, in particular, has been investigated by a number of people. Um, but uh, by, by and large, this area is still underdeveloped and, 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 and worth uh, pursuing further. This, the end term Terminus is also interacting with some interesting uh, cytoskeleton associated protein, for example, dynactin, annexin A2, which is a membrane associated protein, etc. So you can see there's a lot of interaction here in, this, in the microtubule binding domain. There's uh, interactions with uh, chaperones, with phosphatases, with uh, other signaling molecules like uh, calmodulin 1433, RNA, and lipid micelles. RNA, very important because. 
tau may be a component of the stress granules, may be an important parameter uh, of the stress granules, as, as recently uh, published by Ben Bolosin's group. So there's uh, different functions uh, encoded in the different parts of the tau molecule. Just going quickly through some of the pictures, these are tau molecules uh, in, in, in negative stain by electron microscopy. These are uh, tau uh, 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 filaments uh, by um, atomic force microscopy, uh, more or less showing that it has uh, it, it, there are filaments with a with a super super twist uh, which uh, fall down. Now. Uh, just, just defining the assembly, the steps in the assembly process in, in, in global terms is uh, you, you can think of a monomer which is unfolded. Uh, the, the monomer has to come together to a tau dimer. The tau dimer is, uh, actually can be stabilized by dimerization using the SH groups in tau. And then after that, there's a conformational transition uh, which can be induced uh, by, for example, poly anions. And then that forms the initial nucleus of beta street cross call, beta strands cross uh, uh, called cross beta structure because the filament is actually in a uh, in a vertical direction here in this diagram and the filaments run across the axis and therefore this is what is called a cross beta structure and that's what's similar to uh, for many amyloid fibers so this typical kind of uh, a cross beta structure in that regard is similar to, uh, to uh, a beta filaments and uh, many others. Now, the implication of that is uh, if you want to interfere with this toxic uh, pathway of aggregation, then there, you can do two things. You can uh, either, uh, knowing what the elements are that cause the aggregation, namely these hexapeptide motifs, uh, you can either change those hexapeptide motifs so that they cannot aggregate and one way of doing this, this at least in vitro or in animal models is to put in proline mutations because the residue proline is not compatible with beta structure or you can find uh, small molecules that interfere with the uh, uh, self-assembly of tau the PHF inhibitors or tau aggregation inhibitors, and this is uh, this is an avenue that's pursued by uh, a number of labs uh, worldwide, trying to trying as as one approach uh, to to uh, stop the pathology in uh, in uh, in Alzheimer's disease or others, and of course the. Uh, uh, methyl in blue that was uh, mentioned er earlier on today, LMTX, is, is one example of this. Now, I just would like to re uh, remind you that uh, there are several compounds that are useful in monitoring the aggregation of tau, and these compounds are named Congo Red, Thioflavin, and many others. They usually bind along the uh, vertical axis of the filament, and the reason why they bind along the vertical axis is they squeeze in between the, the residues that are lined up as a, beta, as a cross beta structure, and when they squeeze in, uh, that changes their fluorescence properties, and because of that you can observe the, uh, the, um, the, the assembly of uh, particle filaments or other uh, amyloid fibers by the fluorescence properties, in, in the case of tau, particularly by thioflavin S or T. Uh, some more uh, NMR, uh, no, atomic force microscopy studies uh, done in uh, Daniel Müller's lab by Susanne Wegmann, showing that the tau fiber, when you look at it at higher resolution, it has a particular peculiar substructure uh, of uh, about 15 to 30 nanometer uh, um, uh, periodicity, not very well defined, but you can see it here. And when you now fragment the fiber, which you can do in two ways, one is you put the fragment on a hydrophobic surface, and in this case the particle filaments fall apart. They fall apart in, into these little peaks here, and the little peaks, if you look in between, there are little strings in between. So it's as if there are little packages of tau protein uh, that are linked together by something very flexible. And, the same, and, and you can achieve the same thing by simply running your uh, AFM probe across the filament and break it apart. And again, you see these uh, fragments uh, connected by thread-like um, um, elements. I'm saying this because the internal packing of the paratelical filaments, in spite of its apparently regular structure, is still unknown because, again, uh, we've tried all sorts of things. Crystallization didn't work. Uh, NMR doesn't give you results. Solid-state NMR remains ambiguous. So we're still at a point where we know 
generally there's a cross beta structure, but how the elements of tau protein are distributed within a filament, we don't, we don't really know, and therefore it's difficult to predict uh, what kind of uh, approach you should take in order to break apart the filaments. If you're, if you're looking for tau aggregation inhibitors. This just shows an assembly study of regular tau uh, with time uh, when, you, when you let it incubate. Uh, in 48 hours, you get uh, nice filaments. And if you have a mutation that promotes tau assembly, you get actually many more nuclei before you get filaments. This is the Delta K280 mutation. This is interesting because a, a lot of people think or the general consensus is that it is not the tau filaments that is actually toxic to the cell, but it's the things that happen on the way, the oligomers, broadly speaking of oligomers. Oligomers is a way of saying, I don't know, but, uh, but, but they're small and, uh, and they can usually not be spun down by ultrasound centrifugation, so it's probably a broad spectrum of things, but you can see the image of that by, uh, by atomic force microscopy. And again, by atomic force microscopy, if you take the tip and, and, and let it down on a tau filament and ask what is the resistance of a tau filament against this tip, uh, you can, first of all, you get, uh, you, you get this picture here. You have a core, and it's surrounded by a floppy coat of things. And uh, the, uh, the, the scientific name of a floppy coat of things is soft polymer brush, meaning it looks like a brush, and you go, but, but it doesn't offer any resistance. And the brush actually comes in two parts. The inner, well, first of all, you have a fairly rigid core, and you have a more or less a, a basic uh, inner part of, the, of this uh, surrounding and then a more acidic outer part of the surrounding. The, uh, the, the more acidic part on the outside comes from the fact that uh, the C-terminal part of the, the C-terminal 120 residues of tau are pre predominantly uh, acidic, whereas the rest of the molecule is basic. So that's uh, roughly the disposition of the elements in, 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 such, a, in such a fiber. Now let me talk about the regular uh, motives for controlling aggregation. I mentioned before the uh, elements, the hexapeptide motives that are responsible for, for the uh, uh, aggregation. The, these are uh, elements at the beginning of repeat R2 and uh, re uh, repeat R3. I should say there are two nomenclatures. If, if, you, if you read the Tau literature, uh, you will find that uh, people use two, definite, two different definitions of what they call a repeat. If you have four repeats, of course, in, in principle, it's pretty arbitrary. But one, one way uh, which we follow uh, is, is actually the, the, the terminology whereby repeat two corresponds exactly to exon 10. And then that aligns all the other repeats as well. So at the beginning of repeat two and a, a beginning, a beginning of a repeat three, you have these hexapeptide motives. Uh, VQIINK or VQIVYK, and uh, and um, if you mess around, they have an enhanced potential for beta structure. And uh, and if you change these peptides, then of course you affect uh, aggregation. And uh, Martin von Bergen, who who discovered this in the lab, he he uh, coined the term pro-aggregant uh, mutations and anti-aggregant mutations. The pro-aggregant corresponds to the mutation delta K280, which is observed in, in, in tauopathies, uh, which enhances the beta propensity of this element. And the anti-aggregant simply, you, you stick a proline in here, you stick a proline in there, and you get no more, uh, no more aggregation. And the reason why this, is, uh, this turned out to be important uh, in our uh, um, experience is that transgenic mice or transgenic worms or transgenic anything, if they have pro-aggregant mutations, they get sick. And if you just do the anti-aggregant, they stay healthy. So that is a very simple way of manipulating the state of disease. If, you, if tau cannot aggregate, and in fact this protein does not aggregate in, in these different uh, animal models, then you have no effect of tau. You can overexpress it. There may be slight effects of overexpression, but they, the, uh, the animals don't get sick. So therefore, this is a rationale for looking for tau aggregation inhibitors, which we, what, we've, uh, what we and others are doing. So now coming back to how tau interacts with microtubules, I think there is some uh, interesting story to be learned here. This is, this is again results from the uh, Zweckstetter Griesinger lab, Karawat et al., 
who have uh, managed a way to, f uh, to get at the structure of tau elements bound to the microtubules. Don't ask, I, I will not go into uh, the, the details of how they did it. I'm just showing you the tubulin structure as solved by uh, Gigant and Knossoff a few years ago. So we know the tubulin structure in a crystalline form. We can draw models. We, we know where known microtubule binding molecules are located. For example, this is the so-called Vinblastin site. This is the Colchicin site. This is the Taxol site. And it turns out that if you probe, if you ask which parts of tau bind to these sites, uh, then it turns out that um, an important part of tau binds to the Vinblastin site. The Vinblastin site happens to be the site right in between the two alpha beta heterodimers of tau. So, so this is a, of tubulin. Alpha, this is one alpha beta heterodimer. This is another alpha beta heterodimer. The, the two, you stick to the the two together, that's how a microtubule assembles, and right in between, that's where part of the tau binds. And I'll show you an example of what the tau structure is when it binds in there. This is the peptide that contains the beginning of repeat R2. This is the peptide uh, uh, showing the beginning of re repeat R3. They're both similar in structure, and this is a, a more artistic view of it. So what you see here is the PGGG loop before the hexapeptide motif that uh, is responsible for aggregation in, in a beta structure here. So loop and beta structure shown here in an extended form, it becomes a real beta structure only when it interacts with another tau molecule. So that's very important because it explains, um, um, let me see, oh, I'll get the next one here. It, it explains the properties of, a, of, of an antibody that, uh, that I think is highly in interesting. Yeah, here. So uh, Michal Novak in Bratislava, the name was mentioned already today, they're in phase one, two. They're in phase two with their uh, active vaccine and they have an antibody called, they, they, they looked for antibodies that interfered with the microtubule assembly. They found one they called DC8E8, Consecova et al. Uh, and, um, and it turns out that this antibody actually binds at the part just before the hexapeptide motifs that call, uh, cause aggregation. So if you, if you just look at this loop and uh, extended structure here, the antibody epitope would be roughly here, and this would be the part that, uh, that actually uh, then uh, causes aggregation. So the antibody, by, by, by fixing the loop, prevents the aggregation of tau. So it's a, a, a perfect uh, aggregation inhibitor, and therefore it makes sense to develop a vaccine against it, which uh, it works surprisingly well in mice and rats so far, and of course in vitro as well. So uh, I think this is a good example of a link between a, uh, an, an immunological approach to find something that works against tau aggregation and the structural equivalent of it. So we'll see. They, they actually haven't revealed the structure of the antibody itself, but we, we can guess. We can, uh, have a pretty good guess that it is actually here where, where the shadow is. So, um, so it, it makes rational sense to look at antibodies, look at where they bind, and find a structural reason of why they work the way they do. Now, let me say uh, a few words about transgenic animals. Uh, this is mostly uh, the work of Eva's group, so I'll just uh, go quickly and uh, leave out some slides that I don't understand. So uh, uh, here is, again, the tau structure with the hexapeptide motifs. This is where the delta K280 mutation is. And most of the models we made uh, consist of placing pro-aggregant tau into a mouse or, uh, or, or an anti-aggregant tau, and then comparing the two. And, um, and this is done in a uh, inducible way, uh, controlled by uh, doxycycline, basically, so we can switch the, the expression of tau on, and then we can observe the aggregation of tau and the development of pathology, and we can also switch it off, which is a nice part of this application. So you switch the tau off, the tau disappears, and you can ask the question, does the disease go away? It does, actually. So now, first of all, showing you a pro-aggregant mouse, three months old, has a lot of tau deposits in the brain. An anti-aggregant mouse, 
even though it's 22 months old and very aged, shows absolutely no aggregation, which shows you the power of replacing a single proline in an aggregation-prone filament. You get rid of aggregations. It's perfect cure on the basic of on, on the level of molecular biology, at least. So the properties of these regulatable pro-aggregant uh, tau, and I, I forgot to say the other nice thing about these mice is that they co-express luciferase, so you can actually look by bioluminescence at what stage the animals are, so you see a, a, a fluorescent, a, a bioluminescent mouse, and you know it's going to be sick a year from now. So you can actually test, uh, test uh, uh, treatments uh, on these mice. Anyway, these mice show hyperphosphorylation, all the usual things you expect of, uh, of uh, Alzheimer tau. Uh, the mo most important thing is they show synaptic decay, loss of uh, LTP, cognitive impairment, and when you switch off, and that's the main thing here, when you switch off this uh, tau, in this case we do the tau repeat domain, but we also did the full length tau, then you get synapses back and you get the cognition back. So you can cure the memory deficit that these mice develop. And by contrast, the anti-aggregant tau mice don't really show anything. They just don't care about the tau, as long as it doesn't aggregate. This is an example of a water, uh, a water maze experiment. A, a, a regular mouse finds uh, the platform in 10 seconds. Uh, the demented mouse after, I don't know, this is now 12 months switched on. It goes around and round in the basin, but can't, can't really find the platform. So it really has lost spatial memory. But if you switch off tau for just a few weeks, uh, the memory returns. The, 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 uh, and so therefore, it means that if you get rid or if you find a way to neutralize this toxic tau, you're in business as far as treatment is concerned, at least on the level of mice. Um, so uh, the other interesting thing is, of course, that this tau that, that aggregates, aggregates not only by itself, but it also takes the mouse tau and causes co-aggregation of the mouse tau. So what you wind up with is a toxic mix of mouse tau and human tau, in, in this case, uh, um, um, repeat domain. And, and this, is, is the, this is the thing that is toxic to the mouse, whereas if you switch off, then by dynamic instability, these uh, filaments gradually exchange subunits, but since you do not express the toxic tau anymore, gradually you wind up with a pure uh, aggregate of just mouse tau. But the mouse tau, even though it's still aggregated for quite some time after switching off, is still it allows the recovery of memory. So, so the mouse tau, even though it's aggregated, is no longer toxic. The explanation of this phenomenon is probably because the oligomers basically disappear. The, L, the fibers stay around, but the oligomers disappear, and they are the, the, the toxic elements. So, and, uh, and the other thing that, of course, is, is the important observation is that synapses, initially when you express this pro-aggregant tau, synapses disappear, but when you switch off, then the synapses reappear, and that nicely explains the recovery of memory. So implications, learning and memory can be restored if one neutralizes the misfolded toxic tau, and this provides a justification of using compounds or antibodies to inhibit aggregation. I show you uh, some experiments with, with, with this uh, type of transgenic mouse where we tr uh, try to test methylene blue which is uh, sort of the parent molecule of the LMTX, uh, uh, checked by uh, Claude Wischig and colleagues. Actually, I heard about this thing for the first time at the meeting in, in, in Barcelona many, many years ago. Uh, we had a, a FEPS meeting, I believe it was, where he first, for the first time, talked about this thing. I think you organized the session. Right? Or something. Anyway, so, uh, so the kinds of experiments we do is we know that the mouse left alone would, uh, would um, get uh, cognitively demented at age, let's say, 12 months. So we go in with methylene blue, give it, give, give it in the water, and ask how much earlier do we have to give methylene? Can we actually prevent uh, the onset of, of uh, cognitive decline? And how early do we have to go in? And the answer is, uh, even if you go in only relatively shortly before, so the blue arrow shows uh, different time points going in before, even only shortly before, let's say two or three months before, you can totally prevent the development of, uh, of cognitive decline. However, if you do this after the uh, decline has started, you can no longer prevent it. And the, and the uh, explanation for this is this is a somewhat uh, complicated diagram. 
uh, imagine that tau, when you express it, uh, it, aggregates and aggregates and aggregates, and at some point, a cognitive decline will, uh, will begin at the thresh. This is the threshold, basically. When you, uh, uh, when you switch off, in the case where we switched off, you can actually reverse the production of tau and actually get below the threshold. So that's the blue line here. But if you just put in an aggregation inhibitor, it decreases the rate of increase, but it doesn't reverse it. And therefore, but if you decrease the rate, uh, this, this rate sufficiently, then the threshold of cognitive decline will be reached only after the death of the animal. So the animal will never experience cognitive decline. That's, that's why giving methylene blue even relatively shortly before uh, uh, has the effect of, of, uh, of pre protecting the mouse against, uh, against cognitive decline. So I think that's basically what we would like to uh, also have for, for a drug. If we could have a drug that, uh, that makes me sort of demented at age 120, I wouldn't worry too much about it because uh, I'm going to die of other reasons anyway. So, <clears throat> so it shows it is possible. So um, uh, now just uh, just as a, as a way of comparison, we also looked at the A152T uh, mutation, which was uh, a mutation that turned up with a patient who is actually the founder of the Tau Consortium, uh, who, and, and, and so uh, it, it also turned, turned out that, uh, that this is a risk for, a factor for PSP. For, in, um, and, and therefore, so you can ask, what does it do? Because it is outside the repeat domain, and therefore the question was, what, uh, what, are, the, what are the causes of this? So we developed a mouse uh, uh, ex expressing tau A152T in parallel with Leonard Booker's lab. We did a slightly different mouse, and the experiments actually agree quite nicely. The one thing is that this A152T aggregates but not as well as, as uh, uh, normal tau and uh, the aggregates are much more brittle. I won't go into this, uh, but less stable anyway. Um, the, um, the, if you overexpress, uh, or not overexpress, but if you express this uh, protein at low levels actually, you, you still get uh, tangles in the, in the mouse, but at a much later stage you also get hyperphosphorylation. But the main thing you get is uh, you get pronounced astrocytosis and microgliosis, and you get excitotoxicity and epi epileptiform activity in this mouse. So here an example of uh, astrocytosis uh, shown with the uh, IVA1 antibody here and the dentate gyrus, a very striking phenomenon. And, uh, and so what we did is, um, what Eva's uh, group did, uh, she coupled this effect with uh, the expression of luciferase under the GFAP promoter so she could see when uh, the infl inflammatory response would start. It turns out that the inflammatory st response starts at about five months, whereas uh, cognitive decline uh, uh, occurs about 15 months. So we know 10 months before it occurs, which mouse is going to, uh, to be uh, suffering from pathology. And this, of course, the early detection enables the monitoring of the eff efficacy of therapeutic uh, treatments, which is what's going on in the lab at the moment. And, um, and, but, but the other remarkable thing about, well, so let me first say this, these two mice that I've just described have totally opposite effects as far as uh, 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 neuronal activity is concerned. Neuronal activity measured here by calcium uh, uh, increase uh, after uh, chemically induced uh, depolarization, and in the case of the uh, um, Delta K280 mouse, uh, calcium essentially de uh, decreased. There is uh, loss of LTP, and uh, the, 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 the neurons show a, a reduced activity. Whereas in the in the A152T mouse, we get the opposite: a very strong response. Uh, uh, with the A152T and corresponding uh, hyperexcitability. Uh, and the explanation, I'm leaving out a few slides, the explanation is basically you have to imagine that this is the presynaptic part of the synapse. Tau is somewhere in the axon, but it's still primarily in the axon. Uh, however, the effect of it is that uh, when uh, there's excess glutamate uh, uh, released here. The excess glutamate uh, sort of is normally uh, taken up 
it first of all, it causes calcium increase, and calcium, depending on how much of it is, has, uh, can have deleterious effects. For the deleterious effects, in particular in this case, uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, the activation of the extrasynaptic um, NMDA receptors uh, cause, can cause excitotoxicity, Krebs activation, and cell death. Normally, the, uh, the uh, glutamate is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, taken up again by the astrocytes uh, 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 with the uh, glutamate transporters, and you can actually cure the effect, the hyperexcitability. You can cure the effect by ceftriaxone, which is a way to increase the efficiency of the glutamate transporters. And you can, of course, also treat the, these synapses basically with memetin and ifenprodil, which are both drugs that work on the extrasynaptic NNDA receptors. So, um, um, I think I should sort of stop here. Uh, we have the same thing on the level of C. elegans. C. elegans uh, moves nicely uh, around, but when it expresses a tau in the neurons, and, uh, which gets aggregated, then it gets paralyzed. And uh, we use the C. elegans uh, uh, as a cheap way of monitoring drugs, drug effects. I can't go on here. Uh, so I won't go into this, but just show you when we when they are paralyzed. This is where the, the, the mice have uh, the, the C. elegans. The worms have uh, aggregated tau in their neurons. But when you treat them with aggregation inhibitors, then they move quite nicely around. So this is uh, this is not this is an easy experiment to do because the, uh, the the worms take up the drugs much much better than of course uh, the mice because there is no blood brain bar brain barrier. So you can check whether uh, whether an aggregation inhibitor actually works. You can check this relatively quickly, and this works well for the A1, for the Delta K two hundred eighty uh, mutation. But I'm just showing you the uh, the other effect with the A one fifty two T mutation. We can tell that this toxicity is very different from the toxicity that's exerted by the aggregation because here we also get paral paralysis, but the paralysis is not based on aggregation anymore. You don't have aggregates, and you cannot treat by aggregation inhibitors. So, so we find this mouse particularly interesting because it leads us to think that, uh, that there may be some signaling mechanisms that are going awry here in this, in this worm, and this is worth investigating because, uh, of course, there are many interactions that tau can have. So um, uh, I think I'm, um, I was going to, uh, I, I think I'll stop here. Uh, I, just show, I have some slides here on spreading of tau, but uh, let me just go through it. There are so many different ways of spreading, different mechanisms. If there's interest, we can talk about that in a way. It's, it's a totally bewildering business at the moment, so let me just skip through it and let, come to the very last slide I have to show. So the, the, this, is the, this is the team at the, uh, at the German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases and also at the Institute CESAR is currently still located in uh, here, the, the, the institute, DZNE, uh, is uh, moving to a new building or has, well, is in the process of moving to a new building at the Medical School of Bonn University. And our queen equ equivalent, uh, called Joachim Gauck, was just, uh, the, he's the president of uh, Germany. He just visit, visited and said some nice words and said we should find a drug before he gets really old. But he's not going to run for another presidency, which is a pity, probably because he's aware of his age. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, thanks, Hekar. So we have time for one or two quick questions, very quick ones. My name is Justo Jevenes. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's very nice. We have shown a number of years ago that in the absence of parking, tau distribution change from the axon to the perinuclear region. My question is if there is any evidence that under certain circumstances, tau could be a transcription factor or change transcription in any way. 
so, so one part of the answer is that, uh, yes, uh, the observation that tau can change distribution is a very important observation already made uh, by, by the Brock in his early, by uh, Bra uh, the Heike and Eva Brock in the early 90s, uh, which is a very early indicator of the, uh, of the fact that something is going wrong. Now, I think it can have uh, different reasons. Uh, tau is a very sensitive indicator of stress, of uh, anything that can go wrong. It can, ha it can have probably different explanations. One explanation is that tau can move into the axon, but it can also move out of the axon. Uh, th that has to do with the barrier of tau at the um, axon initial segment. The other um, explanation that uh, we currently favor at the moment is that if tau gets missorted, uh, the, the, the term that is often used in this context is missorting. Uh, when tau is missorted into the cell body and into the dendrites, uh, that has to do uh, with, the fact, with the fact that the axonal transport does not work properly anymore. So, uh, so it's, it's synthesized in the cell body, but it doesn't go away into the axon and therefore accumulates in the cell body. This is, for example, the case if you challenge neurons in, in cell culture with a beta, for example. We initially thought we, missorting comes from the idea that you have something that's sorted into the axon and now it go, it's missorted into the somatodendritic compartment, but actually it never gets into the axon, it just stays in the cell body. And that may very well be uh, because of uh, you know, something that has to do with protein synthesis or, or you know, could have something to do with the stress granules, uh, with cells under stress, where, where then uh, you know, the, the, the proper sorting of your molecule to the tiny hole that is represented by the axon cannot be done anymore. I, I, uh, there's a very nice paper by Hirokawa's group, I think Nakata Hirokawa about 2002, who, who describes how difficult it is with, for a soluble protein like tau to actually find the axon. I mean, you, you, uh, you know, you, you're, you're on the surface of the earth and you want to climb the Eiffel Tower. How do you find the base of the Eiffel Tower? The fact is, normally you don't find it. Uh, so there's an intricate mechanism that needs to guide the axonal proteins into the axon. And if something is messed up there, then it's easy to see why it, it gets missorted. There's a long answer for saying, I don't really know. <laughs> Uh, Erhard, uh, uh, pro aggregant tau uh, in the presence of heparin results in the appearance of many, many small aggregates and some few filaments or large aggregates. The question is, if you add methylene blue, is faster the destruction or the inhibition for the small aggregates or for the uh, larger filaments? Uh, have you studied that? Uh, I, th I think we, we never addressed the question the way you do. I mean, we, we looked basically always for thioflavin fluorescence and, uh, and looked at the increase or decrease of thioflavin. It's certainly an interesting question. I would imagine that the small aggregates disappear faster, but I don't really know. Yeah. Uh, what we, Eva knows better. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. We threw, of course, uh, uh, methylene blue onto fibers and oligomers, and then they partly dissolve. Yes, in EM and in AFM we did this. Yeah, but the question is which one dissolves faster? And okay. I, 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 um, Sorry. I, I, yeah, I think actually, you know, it, it, it would probably be very difficult because, you know, which technique do you use to actually make that statement? AFM, presumably, or, yeah. In the case of the wild type, you have fibers. In this case, you have a lot of the small ones and a few right. fibers. If you do with wild type and with the, uh, right. the pro -argan, perhaps you have uh, Relative, relative easy answer. Because I think it could be, could be important because it's about the importance of, the, as you said, the oligo, uh, oligomers, or is the importance of the filaments. That probably everybody said that 
is more important than oligomers that, uh, but, but it's not really, really demonstrated. Yeah, I mean, and of course it gets even more complicated. There is a recent paper by, by Sigurdsson's group who says, who has developed an antibody that binds only to the monomer, and that's the only antibody that works in his. Although there are some issues with the paper, I think it would need to be, we can discuss later, but anyway, uh, it's really very complicated yeah. field. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much.